Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to have you here at Connecticut's Old State House, especially being that it's a gorgeous day outside, so we really appreciate you being here. And there are seats up front, I promise, no one bites here. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to Connecticut's Old State House for this, the first in our two-part series that's commemorating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here at the Old State House, and it's really great to have you here with us. Today's program is entitled, The Day the Earth Stood Still. I'd like to invite you, you have some things on your chair. Um, I'd like to invite you to join part two of this lecture series next Tuesday on July the 16th, which will cover more of the actual moon landing. And then after we finish uh, this afternoon, the farmer's market is ongoing until two o'clock and that takes place all summer from 10 to two o'clock and we invite you to join us for that and for the concerts that are held most Fridays. One thing that's a, a special treat is when you can invite people um, back to the old state house who are old friends. Um, today's speaker, Hamish Lutris, is, an, is the, an associate professor um, over at Connecticut, excuse me, over at Capital Community College in Hartford, which is just down the street. It, it seems kind of strange to be welcoming you formally because Hamish has um, teaches classes here at the Old State House, sometimes for CCC, so it's fun to have him back here speaking. And if you've been here before, you know he's a wonderful speaker um, and covers lots of different topics. Hamish um, has worked in some of America's premier natural and historical sites, leading hiking and historical programs. He has also lectured extensively in the United States, Europe, and Canada, presenting programs on wide-ranging historical topics, including Native American history, the Civil War, scientific history, social and cultural history, and you might have been with us for the series on World War I that he did today, I sh or he did uh, recently. I should also mention that we are being videotaped and recorded for the Connecticut Network, so please don't do anything that your mother would be ashamed <laughs> of seeing. And so now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hamish. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, folks. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a little strange that we have a, a room, and I did want to explain to people why I'm speaking with a mic, because I'm coming across real strong. And we are recording this for, um, and, and what is it? It's Connecticut General Assembly TV, right? CTN, and there we are. All right. Well, in that case, folks, uh, first thing I'd like to say is thank you very much for inviting me out today. Um, it's very nice to be here, um, and I'd like to make a couple of announcements just before I, I start my talk. Um, and they're just kind of basic announcements, kind of standard. Um, if at any time during the talk you'd like to get up, stretch your legs, uh, visit the restroom, or get a drink of water, uh, you're not bothering me. I won't vouch for your neighbors. Um, you will be here for the next four and a half hours listening to this, so you might want to, you know, plan for that. Um, the other thing is, if you, if you want something like a little clarification, or if I go by a slide too fast and you'd like to look at it again, don't hesitate to say so during the talk. Uh, the only uh, caveat I would give you is that if you ask me a question, I'll really have to answer it. I'd, I'd like to put that off until the end so that we don't really take up too much of the presentation itself. Um, but today, I'm going to be speaking for the first of two parts about uh, essentially space and the space program that eventually will get us to the moon on July 20th. 1969. Now that, that talk is going to be divided into two parts, and today I'll be talking about the lead up to that, basically up until uh, January 27th, 1967, which is the day that, um, uh, tragically, that we began really the official Apollo program with the Apollo 1 disaster. And what I'm going to do today is talk about what led us up to that time in 1967. Um, now, as a start off, I just wanted to kind of show you this. One of the things we find about space topics is that they are very fun to talk about. Just always want to ask very quickly, um, anyone in here, if you're old enough to remember, and I know most of us probably aren't, does anyone remember where you were on July 20th, 1969? You guys remember? Excellent. Only two of you? Three. Okay, good. All right, lots of children of the 60s here. They're not quite sure what happened back then. All right, I won't ask again. That'll be fine. But today, the, the, the talk I'm going to give will be actually the day the Earth stood still. Um, and it's, it is really interesting to go into this idea of how close we are to this space program. Um, Apollo 11, just so you know, actually had 400,000 people working on it. And in Connecticut, I will tell you, there are almost no places you can go 
talk about Apollo 11 without somebody in the audience be a being able to stand up and say, well, I did this, or my dad or my cousin did that. It's actually very interesting to see how involved we all were with it. And it's really a very much a national and international thing. And this is the way we started off by talking about a couple of different things, and really three mainly. How we got into space, how atomic power and weapons were going to affect this idea of the space race, and, of course, the Cold War, and how that will affect the space race as well. And they all do, and they kind of do so in, a, in an intertwined fashion in the years after World War II. And to start us off, basically, we'd want to think about 1945. And in 1945, folks, World War II was over, and the United States was the greatest thing in the world since sliced bread. We had won the war. Everybody was happy. You've probably seen this photograph before. It's a pretty good sum up of the, what we felt in 1945. And why do we feel so good? It's very simple. First of all, World War II was a war in which we knew that we were on the right side. And that's kind of a tough thing. Often, you're not quite sure, but we were very sure, especially with what we saw as we went through the war. The other reason that we knew that we were the bee's knees in 1945 is because we were the sole nuclear power in the world. We had done something that most people had thought was absolutely impossible to even achieve, and we had done it in an incredibly short time. And that, of course, was the development of the atom bomb, something no one had ever seen before. This development really begins to get a lot of traction in 1939. 1939, these two men, the man on the left you might recognize as Albert Einstein, and the man on the right is a Hungarian scientist named Leo Szilard. And these two people essentially realize that with the growing amount of technology concerning atomic uh, matters back then, that the technology was coming that would be able to make a massive bomb. And no one knew what this was going to be like at the time. It was only a rumor. And so Szilard writes a letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and says, you should probably be looking into this. And eventually what's going to happen is a project will be formed. Now this project is based, first of all, in the US Army Corps of Engineers, which is what gives it its logo down here. And it's based in a few office buildings in Manhattan. So it's called the Manhattan Project. It has almost nothing to do with Manhattan, of course, but it is kind of a neat thing to see. And the Manhattan Project took out an amazing amount of American resources during the war. It's going to be built, or the atomic bomb will be built basically in two places. This is one, it's called Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The other place, is in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And these are the two main areas where we're going to be building an atomic weapon. Just so that you understand how much energy we're putting into this, folks. Uh, when you look at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, this is an area that was built specifically to do a lot of the background work for the atomic bomb. This site alone, in World War II, when all of our factories were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this site took up 10% of the total energy output of the United States in the year. That is an amazing figure when you think about everybody working essentially night and day. It's a great deal of energy is going into this, a great deal of brain power as well. The man who's going to be heading up this project is this man, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Now, Oppenheimer, I, I think he would really enjoy this picture of himself. He looks very sophisticated in it, and also kind of a little bit kind of out there. Oppenheimer was a, an incredible figure, uh, very intellectual, very interested in ancient Indians, had a lot of kind of wide range of interests, but a great nuclear physicist. And what they are going to come up with are basically two bombs. And they're going to build these to essentially threaten the end of the war on Japan. In the end, what they will do is drop both of them. First bomb is dropped on August 6th, the second one on August 9th, 1945. And when they're dropped, they're essentially going to do two things. Number one, they're going to end the war almost immediately. And number two, they are going to mean that America will be the most powerful country on Earth. The people who drop the bombs of these men, man in the middle is uh, Paul Tibbetts, who was actually the commander of Enola Gay, named the uh, plane after his mother. And they went up, and actually it's kind of interesting to see this, because as they were given the briefing for the, uh, for the flight, 
Um, they started asking questions, because we didn't know what radiation did at this time. So they were all asking, you know, what about the radiation? And they, the guys were telling them, well, you know, radiation's probably not going to be a big thing. But every one of them was very careful to put a large piece of aluminum foil on their seat when they actually sat down in the plane. Because you didn't want that radiation kind of coming up underneath you and, you know, you know kind of, uh, you know, affecting you in ways down there. These guys are very careful about this. And when they come over and drop the bomb, what we had thought was that this was a perfect way to end the war. It was a massive detonation. The one that you're looking at right now is the detonation that occurred over Nagasaki on August 9th. But folks, the destruction from these bombs that we saw in the beginning brought the Japanese to the peace table almost immediately. August 16th, the Japanese did indicate a willingness to surrender, and in fact, they did. For many people, the atom bomb, therefore, was really the thing that meant the end of the war. And so for us, we thought this was a great thing. We looked at these cities and we thought, nobody in the world is going to be dumb enough to challenge us to a war ever again. At least this is what we thought at the time. However, there are problems with atomic power. And the first one is this. In 1945, we thought that essentially atomic power was going to be our servant forever. And so this co political cartoon, the true story of Aladdin, right? And the genie comes up, and the genie of atomic power, and he says, what wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thou as a slave, right? Essentially, folks, we thought atomic power and weaponry was going to serve us forever. In 1949, we got a very disturbing wake-up call. Just like Robinson Crusoe discovering the single footprint on the beach and finds out that he's not alone, in 1949, the... Soviet Union exploded its first atomic weapon. This is actually a, a weapon that the uh, Americans must have liked a lot. They called it Joe One. And so Joe One went off in 1949, and we realized we are not alone in the atomic world. Suddenly, there are going to be problems out here because up until 1945, the Soviet Union had been our ally. After 1945, that status began to change a great deal. By 1949, we were quite sure that they were now going to be our enemy for what we called in the next 40 years the Cold War. Now, there's another thing that begins to disturb us about the atom bomb, and that is, at first, we saw the atom bomb just the way I showed it to you a few slides ago, and that is the destruction from afar. We, we actually looked at this and said, this is great. We weren't that close to it. I remember hearing a comedy routine from 1945, and two men were joking about Hiroshima, and they said, it looks like Ebbets Field after a Giants-Dodgers game. Very funny, right? Because we all had free-for-alls out there. What's going to happen, however, is that people begin to realize that this destruction is a much more gruesome thing up close than it was from far away. That literally hundreds of thousands could die in such a nuclear conflagration. In fact, we might be able to destroy the entire world. And this begins to really frighten people. Now, in the MOD report, and that is uh, a Defense Department report in 1941, what they also uh, said, and this was not really released to people until after 1945, was that we have now reached the conclusion that it will be possible to make an effective uranium bomb, which would also release large quantities of radioactive substance, which would make places near to where the bomb exploded dangerous to human life for a long period. This was part of the atomic bomb that no one really thought about. The bomb went off, people died, people survived. But then they began to remark that people began to actually uh, appear as if their skin had been burned off. People began to uh, notice that the rain over Hiroshima was literally black in color and that it sickened people that it fell on. This was something that we didn't know about because in reality, Radioactivity was something we always saw as actually a pretty positive thing. Radioactivity was only discovered in about 1895-96 by Marie Curie. And actually, what we thought was that this was probably the best way, um, if you don't mind me being a little adult, this is the best way for men to retain their manliness long into life. Drink radiated water, and this is great stuff. Um, we could also, and, and folks, just remember, if, if you have any problems with your skin, you could put radioactive substance on your skin. And of course, it's for all kinds of ulcerations and diseases of the skin. I'm sure it probably worked like a charm, ladies and gentlemen. But 
By the 1940s, we're beginning to get a little suspicious of this. And what happens after Hiroshima is going to make people really think differently about this. The bomb itself was something that frightened us a great deal. And this is going to go deeply into our psyche as we move into the 1950s. Now, if folks are old enough, and, and actually, I'm just about old enough to remember the very end of it, but you might remember these duck and cover drills. We had to go under the desk because, after all, if an atomic bomb goes off, folks, at least you're under a desk. That'll protect you. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but they also used to have cartoons with Tommy the Turtle, and he would actually know he had to duck and cover, you know, and you just look at it and you think, wow, it must have been something to think about atomic war like this. But really, it goes very deep, as I said. Um, if you ever have heard of a man named Bill Haley, have you guys ever heard of a song called Rock Around the Clock, See You Later, Alligator, one of the great rockabilly artists of the 50s? He wrote a song called 13 Women. And of course, he looks on the bright side of nuclear conflagration, as you can see. Last night, I lay dreaming, dreamed about the H-bomb. The bomb went off, and I was caught. I was the only man underground. There were 13 women and only one man in town. 13 women and only one man in town. Funny as it may be, the one and only man in town was me. 13 women, only one man around. Fantastic for Mr. Haley, right? We kind of look at the bright side of this, but in reality, folks, the 1950s tended to be a time where we were extremely paranoid about the uh, possible damage that would be caused by radioactivity. You might remember a couple of movies, Them, giant ants invading Los Angeles, folks. Always really kind of interesting to see, right? And remember, it's a horror horde of crawl and crush giants crawling out of the earth from mild, deep catacombs. Also, it's interesting, nuclear radiation made these ants real big, but it also gave them eyes, which is kind of really creepy looking when you look at the poster. And of course, 1954, we had Godzilla, the king of the monsters, right? Affected by nuclear radiation, grows to a large size, and comes back and destroys Tokyo, a very symbolic monster. We can also see, however, that this concern is actually one that's pretty well justified by recent events. In 1986, the uh, nuclear plant at Chernobyl in Ukraine actually did melt down. And right now, folks, what you are looking at is an area somewhere around the size of New England or so. Some of the prime agricultural land in the world cannot be used and will never be used by the human race again. Um, there's literally nothing you can do in, in Chernobyl at all. Or, if we want to look at another one, um, this is kind of a strange picture, but what you are looking at, folks, is literally thousands of garbage bags. They are garbage bags of tainted soil from Fukushima, Japan. When uh, the uh, tidal wave, you might remember the tsunami that came in and hit the nuclear plant in Fukushima, the entire area was completely tainted by radioactive waste. All of this is the topsoil from Fukushima. They literally had to dig down, they've dug it all up. Their problem is now, what do you do with it all? And we really don't know. So at this point, we do have some concerns about radioactivity. This is going to be doubled when we look at a couple of other things, and that is mainly how we can deliver radioactive materials. Now, folks, the story of flight is a separate story in and of itself, and I could probably go on for weeks about it. It's a fascinating story. But the first idea we have of human heavier-than-air powered flight is right here on December 7th, 1903, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. These are the Wright, Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville, and they flew this plane about 120 feet. This is the Kitty Hawk. Now, this is 1903, folks, and I'd like you to keep in mind, we walked on the moon in July 20th, 1969, which means it's in 66 years from getting off the ground to getting on the moon. That is less than a lifetime. You could have seen both of those events actually occur in a normal lifetime. It's kind of interesting because from here, we are going to expand flight technology and abilities greatly. Of course, this man in 1927 flies across the Atlantic Ocean on a solo flight, takes him 33 and a half hours, kind of like today, folks. If you've ever flown over to Europe, you probably know. Most of that time you'll spend in line going through the metal detector. So that's about 25 hours, the rest of it's the flight. But Charles Lindbergh essentially flies over the Atlantic and when he does, flight takes off. I don't mean to make a bad pun there, but after this you're going to have the development of airlines and very quickly we are also going to develop aircraft that are much more effective than they had been. And so in 20 years after Lindbergh crosses the Atlantic, in 1947, Chuck Yeager, 
uh, will actually break the sound barrier with this plane, the X1. And when they do, people begin to think about the idea of going out into space. This is going to be one of the things that really drives the space race a great deal, that we're developing technology that can be paired up with radioactive technology, and the horrors that might result from that are going to be what really drives us a lot. The last thing I just wanted to tell you about, uh, about flight is right here, and that is by the 1940s, not only could we fly fast, we could fly a lot. What you are looking at is actually a picture of an airplane coming into Berlin's airport in 1948. From June 48 until May of 1949, folks, if you want to see the power of flight, this is a, a worthwhile event to examine. In, Ju in June of 1948, the Soviet Union cut off the city of Berlin from Allied access. People thought that the city would then starve to death, and they needed something on the order of seven or 8,000 tons of supplies per day to be able to survive. This is a major city. The Americans and allies actually set up what is called the Berlin Airlift, and that's what you're looking at right now, is a plane going into West Berlin, and for one year, the allies supplied 13,000 tons per day of supplies to Berlin, one aircraft after another, just coming in. After about six months, the Soviets stopped blocking access because they realized it was useless, but we kept going with the blockade because we weren't sure if they were going to put it in again. So again, when you're looking at the power of air travel, you can see it by 1948, we can carry a lot of stuff, we can carry a lot of destruction if we wish to, and we can do it with a very fast speed. However, it's not getting us into space, and the way we're gonna get into space is a different way. Rather than aircraft, we're gonna use rockets. Now, rockets are not a new thing, folks. They've been around for a very long time. This is the first depiction of rockets. It's from around the um, turn from BC into AD from ancient Chinese sources. And the Chinese used rockets fairly early on. What they would do is make something like this, a large arrow, about four or five feet long, and then attach gunpowder to it. They would light the gunpowder, and the force would go out from behind, and the arrow would fly out. And these things had ineffective, they weren't very accurate, but they had a range of about a half a mile, which is much better than a bow and arrow would do. It's also psychologically a very frightening weapon because they're just flying in, they make a screaming noise, you never know when they're gonna hit or where. So they actually are gonna have this technology and the Mongols will bring it into the West in the 1300s. They go as far as the city of Vienna and when they bring in their rockets in the Middle Ages in Europe, they're also going to adapt a lot of these. By the 1700s, we also have these, well, I should say late 1700s, because they're also gonna be used in the 1800s in the Napoleonic Wars. These are known as Congreve's rockets, and it's the same thing. You light it up here, it explodes, and the rocket will go out. Now, as I said, not very effective weapons, not very accurate, but very powerful in that initial thrust. When people first began to think about going out in space, they thought this might be a way to do it, and a lot of the models you see at first are things like a giant cannon shooting people out into space, right? a gunpowder blast. But if you think about it for a minute, folks, if I give you a piece of gunpowder, you explode it, it explodes immediately, which means if that doesn't get you out of the atmosphere, you're just going to languish about midway up. This is not going to get us into space. But we will see that in the 1860s, we begin to think really seriously about this. Now, in the 1860s, a man named Jules Verne came up with the three first real modern works of science fiction. In 1863, he writes a book called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which explores the undersea world and the fantasy world that we might find down there. In 1864, he writes Journey to the Center of the Earth, and people will go under an Icelandic volcano, find this great prehistoric world of fantasy. And then in 1865, he writes From the Earth to the Moon, and there, a group of people will be shot out of a giant cannon and they will go to the moon and they meet up with the people there. And actually what happens in the end of the first book, very unsatisfying, is that you never find out what happens to the astronauts. They just go up to the moon and people say, well, that's great, they made it. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I need a sequel. And so he actually did write a sequel from the moon to the earth. Uh, it didn't go over quite as well. You know, the, the sequels never work as well, folks. But What's gonna happen is that this book will also influence a man who is very important and probably the one man who is the first true thinker of space travel. And this is Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. 
Now, Tsiolkovsky is an interesting man. You would never hear about him. No one really ever heard about him during his life. He lived in a fairly small village about 200 miles southwest of Moscow. And a lot of what he talked about, people never really thought about too much. He never thought that anything that he wrote would ever be accepted by anyone except himself. But it turns out that this guy was really the one who thought most realistically about space travel. The way he did this was, number one, he was the first person who said, gunpowder won't get you there. You're going to need some kind of sustained liquid energy blast. In other words, a blast that will begin and that will keep going. The other thing that Tsiolkovsky talks about is having a multi-stage rocket. He says, instead of blasting yourself out into space, you blast yourself up, and then you let the first stage fall, and then you blast again. And this, of course, is the way we did go to the moon. So this is the guy who actually kind of puts this down first. He also is going to be the first person who gives us a design for a spaceship. And he does this about 1903. And his spaceship, it's kind of difficult to extrapolate it out from here, but the spaceship essentially is right up here. That's your first stage, and that's going to drop off, and then the spaceship will travel on. We have this idea of space travel, but really until later on, we're not going to get too much detailed information about it. Now, folks, you might know that when we send a rocket up into space, you don't send it straight up and, and just kind of pierce the atmosphere like a nail would pierce wood. Instead, what we do is we send it up, and it kind of will curve over so that it kind of slingshots out of the atmosphere. Well, Robert Edno Peltier, or Peltieri, is actually the man who came up with the formulae that were going to get us into space specifically. So he said when the first stage drops off, you're going to have to change your angle. He is also the man who began to think about steering a spaceship by means of small blasts of energy. We call these today retro rockets. And so when you want to steer a spaceship, you blast out here and it'll bring you to the left, and then you blast out the other side, brings you to the right. So again, a very influential thinker. Also, if you're interested in aer uh, aeronautics, folks, this is the man, if you ever look at an airplane, you ever see an airplane tail, comes up and then ha also has two going out. He's the man who's really responsible for that design. He's also responsible for flaps on airplanes that will make you go up or down. And he's also responsible for the idea of the joystick. He's the first person who used a stick to actually steer an airplane. So very influential man in many ways but also that idea that now we're getting the formulae that are going to take us literally out into space. And of course, the man who really is going to make the first rockets is an American. His name is Robert Goddard. And Goddard, in 1926, will be able actually to create a kind of liquid propulsion that is going to be used, a form of it anyway, to actually do the first space launches. Now, Goddard is interesting because a lot of times he actually didn't have money to, uh, to carry out his experiments. And the, the person who really financed him was the most famous man in the world at the time. His name was Charles Lindbergh. And so in the 1930s, Lindbergh was actually pretty influential in this way as well. Now, Goddard is actually going to do a series of launches with small rockets, but he experiments with that liquid fuel, and this works out very, very successfully. So as we're going into the 1930s, we see that we're beginning to look at outer space a little bit. That's not the first time we've looked at outer space, but most of the time we look at outer space, it's with kind of hostile eyes. I mean, this is actually a front piece from an H.G. Wells novel called War of the Worlds. H.G. Wells was very much a utopian, and he thought it would be great to have an alien invasion because he thought it would make everyone on Earth get together and think about how great it was to be together. I'm not sure if that was the greatest idea. I mean, we've seen it in the movies, folks. We know what happens, right? If you've ever seen Independence Day, right? You know, all the people come together. I don't know. I guess it might sound okay. But we've been very scared about this ever since we thought about actually getting into space. Remember Flash Gordon, right? 1936, Flash Gordon conquers the universe. Goes out there and you've got this evil emperor named Ming the Merciless, right? And, of course, he has a daughter who falls in love with Flash Gordon. It's a great story, folks. But what we find is that the idea of going into space becomes more and more popular for everyone in America, really, during the 1930s. After Lindbergh had flown, the idea of flight really became deeply ingrained in our psyche, you might say. Now, in the 1940s and 50s, we are also going to find a couple more figures that are going to be very, very big in uh, rocket travel. This is Hermann Oberth. Oberth was actually a German and lived in Romania, then Germany, then the United States, and back into West Germany. 
but Olbrecht was actually uh, considered one of the great intellectuals of his time in rocket science, and he's the guy who said, actually, you're not going to be able to have a two-stage rocket. It's going to have to be three stages. More than anyone else, his concepts are going to go into what we call the Saturn V rocket, which will bring people to the moon. He is also the man who finalized the formula for the liquid propulsion that would actually get us up in, into space. And more than that, he is also a dedicated Nazi. Now, the reason I'm talking about this, folks, is because during the war, World War II, that is, um, Germany always had this idea of itself that it would develop these wonder weapons that were just going to destroy the Allies and German technology would win it all. They did actually develop a rocket-powered aircraft. It's right here, the ME-163 Comet. It had a flight time of six minutes, folks. And if you wanted to be a real spineful test pilot, this is the, the plane you might fly. It'll get, take you up, almost fell down there, okay. It'll take you up, the wheels will then fall off, and when you come back down to ground, you'd better be out of fuel, because you're going to be sliding along the ground to, uh, to land. And back here where you have the rocket fuel, there's nothing that separates that from the cockpit. In other words, folks, most of the guys who fly with these end up blowing up in the air, because the rocket fuel simply ignites, and that's the end of the, the trip. So. If you really felt good about being a test pilot, I suppose you could do that. They were getting close, however, and this was going to give people a little bit of fear, especially with this man's program. This is Werner von Braun, and von Braun is really NASA's guy who designed the Saturn V, folks. He was also uh, in the SS in the very late 30s and the early part of World War II. Werner von Braun designed a couple of uh, weapons for Nazi Germany, but this is the one that really scared people the most. It's known as the V-2, and this is called an intercontinental ballistic missile. The thing about this weapon, folks, is that once you launch it, nobody can stop it. It goes too fast. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know where it'll blow up. But if you think about us developing an atomic weapon in conjunction with an intercontinental ballistic missile, you can probably imagine we're getting pretty scared of what's going to be happening in the future. Von Braun is going to be captured by the Americans. He will be quite willingly captured by the Americans, and then he will go to the United States, and he will be really the guy who helps design the Saturn rockets that will take us to the moon. Now, besides this, all right, actually, I wanted to put this in too. Uh, Von Braun, I'm not sure if his humor is really good for you guys or not, but he said this, there's just one thing I can promise you about the outer space program. Your tax dollar will go further. Okay, folks, well, it was a scientific technology joke. I'm, I'm going to go right by it now. Okay, in that case, let's look at something happier, the Soviet Union. Now, the last part of why we were so scared and why we went into space with the energy and the focus and determination that we did was because we were scared that the Soviet Union might be doing the same thing and might be doing it quicker. And for many parts of the space race, that is indeed true, ladies and gentlemen. As soon as World War II was over, the Soviet Union was very interested, both in um, developing new technologies and also in fomenting worldwide revolution. And so we see in the United States, is this tomorrow? And you might notice this, folks. Never seen the Capitol fly in the hammer and sickle, right? A nightmare scenario for all of us. Um, if you look here, Howard McGrath, famous historian, says, there are many communists in America. They are everywhere in factories, offices, butcher stores. Be very careful when you buy your meat, right? On street corners, in private businesses, and each carries within himself the germ of death for society. We saw ourselves locked in a life and death struggle with the Soviet Union for world domination. And we knew if Russia should win, you might notice this, folks, I never knew their boots were that big. But it says down here, in case the communists should conquer, our women would be helpless beneath the boots of the Asiatic Russians. Scary stuff, folks, all right? But the fact of the matter is, right, as we look at this, it kind of serves both sides, because what you should also know is that both sides were also very frightened of a nuclear conflict. And both sides really did not want to go near something like that. As this kind of rhetoric begins to ratchet up in the 1950s, this is going to be something that scares us a lot and starts driving us towards space uh, for the simple fact that it's the one area that we can compete in where we will not end up killing each other. And this is something that both sides like. Because we now have a bipolar world. In the yellow is the Warsaw Pact and the communist forces. In the green is the West and NATO forces. 
We were very scared of a war occurring between these. And when the Soviet Union developed its atom bomb in 1949, we knew that they were going to be using this against us. In addition, if they got into space, who knew what they were going to be able to do from space, especially with intercontinental ballistic missile technology. And so, anything to do with the Soviet Union folks in the 1950s and 60s, as Archibald McLeish said, no man could be elected to public office unless he was on record as detesting the Russians. And no proposal could be enacted from a peace plan at one end to a military budget on the other unless it could be demonstrated that the Russians wouldn't like it. And so we were looking for every way we could to compete with the Russians. The space race, as I said, is one of the safest ways to do it, but we are going to be quite scared of doing this. And there are a whole slew of uh, me movies that come out during the 1950s that will indicate this. The Day the Earth Stood Still is one of them. And if you're familiar with this movie, right, the aliens land, and they're surrounded by the US Army immediately, and the guy comes out and he wants to hand the humans something that will allow them to communicate with other worlds, and he gets shot doing it, right? The, the world is on the edge of atomic annihilation, right? And although I, I never saw that scene in there where the guy was doing all this. Anyway, but the day the earth stood still is a good symbol of our uh, idea that the world was on the brink of absolute destruction. Both leaders, Soviet and American, wanted to do something to try to head off the idea of nuclear power going wild. Space race, as I said, it's a good way to do it. And for a while, it will be the Russians who have the lead. This is actually the head of the Russian space program. His name is Sergei Korolev. And what's interesting is, you guys know his name. His name was never released until 1989. Up until then, he was only known by one name, Chief Designer. That's it. Yuri Gagarin, who flew in his first spacecraft designed by Mr. Korolev, knew him as Chief Designer. Joseph Stalin's policy was that if people found out this man's name, they would try to assassinate him. No one ever knew this man's name until the late 1980s when these records are actually released. So we didn't know this guy for a long time. Now, this is a man who basically designs the Soviet uh, uh, space program. And as I said, for a while, folks, he's the one who's successful. This is the R2 rocket, the first rocket that actually made it out into outer space. Did it without any kind of passengers on it, but already, the Americans are being hard pressed by this, that now they've got a race against this. And no one's quite sure what to do on October 4th, 1957, when they send this up into space. This is called Sputnik 1. And when they sent it up, it actually, all it did was put out a radio signal for a while. But this was the great step. The, the Soviet Union had now made it out into space. As Leonid Khrushchev was talking about how great this was, he actually had a meeting with Mao Zedong, and Mao said, you should just take a bunch of nuclear weapons and put them onto a Sputnik, and then just drop it on the United States. At that point, the Soviet Union and China began to kind of move apart on this policy. Khrushchev really didn't want that. But what we also find is that the Soviets were going to beat us on the second thing, too. They sent the first living being out into space, and his name is Laika. Laika is a dog, right? I, I'm sorry. I think you might have recognized that when I said that. But um, Laika actually is a very interesting animal. Um, like a lot of other things, the Soviet space program is under complete secrecy. Now, what we know about Laika is that he goes up into Sputnik 2, they put him inside it, and then he will go up into space. It has now been revealed in the last couple of years that he died within six hours that actually a heat shield uh, failed and that he literally just burned up to death very, fairly quickly. Sorry to be grim for you. Um, but otherwise, it would have been him starving in space, folks. So, you know, make your choice. But I will tell you that they never released this information until after 1989 as well. They can also, and you can find this online, if you, talk, if you see what the Soviet scientists said, a bunch of them will say, we were proud to be doing the Soviet thing, and they all hated having to send Laika up into space. The guy who actually owned him you know, and brought him to the spaceship said, I've never been able to really get over it. This is like 20 or 30 years later, you know, that he had sent this dog up basically to, to die. You know? But again, the Soviet Union was successful in this, and America's getting left behind. Then, in 1961, they are extremely successful when they take a spaceship and send up this man into space, Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin is an important figure for two reasons. He is the first man who ever flew in space, number one. And number two, actually three reasons. Number two, 
Look at this guy. He's a perfect poster boy for the Soviet Union. They said that this guy's smile would melt an entire room all at once. But also, he's a great poster boy for communism. His parents were blue collar workers. He made it forward on his own. And so people really like this idea. Gagarin actually will be the first man to fly in space. Um, strangely enough, he dies actually very early on in a very routine flight, getting him from one airfield to another. Uh, he and a, an instructor that he was with. So he, he does meet a tragic end, but having the first man in space means that the Americans are really feeling very put out about now. Second, uh, or I should say also, the Soviets will take the first dark side of the moon pictures. This is Luna 3, the first picture ever taken of the uh, far side of the moon. They do this in 1963, and again, the United States is getting now scared. They, these guys are moving ahead. Even worse, they send up the first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova, in 1964. The Americans are being left behind almost completely. I just wanted to point this out, too. Tereshkova here, kind of see the international nature of space flight. She's giving an award to Neil Armstrong. This is actually like 1975. Tereshkova is still alive today and still talks about her uh, experiences in space. But as we look at these guys, we're seeing that the Soviet Union is making a major move forward. 1966, they send the first man out to walk in space. And that is Sergei, uh, what's his last name? Alexeyev. Now, with Alexeyev, actually, it's quite interesting, too. I don't know about you guys, but this would scare me. They said when he went out into space, all right, first of all, the heating uh, protectants in his suit failed. So inside of his suit, it was about 150 degrees, literally like a sauna. And so he was out there, and he said, it was weird. He said, I kept moving around because there was so much sweat on his body that the suit kept kind of like moving around him. He said it was really creepy. But what was real bad was when he tried to get back into the spaceship, the heat had expanded his spacesuit. So he literally couldn't get into the ship. So he's out there basically in space trying to get into this little thing. And he has to literally in space depressurize his suit in order to get in. I don't know about you. I am not letting my oxygen out into space just so that I can get into this hatch, but he did. He survived it all, and he said afterwards, yes, it was a very exciting ride. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so, right? Now, at this time, as I said, the Americans were feeling very challenged, but in 1958, they're going to put together their own program, and this is going to be the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. And when they get together, they are not going to let the Russians really outdo them too much. First of all, in 1961, John F. Kennedy will announce, and really, folks, this is kind of off the cuff. Um, they never really thought about this, but he said in this speech in Texas that he would send a man to the moon and bring him back alive by the end of the decade. And later on, they asked Kennedy, you know, like, what, where'd you get this figure? You know, because this is 61, so you're talking nine years. He said, well, it was an even figure. I figured it would be okay to kind of say it that way. So basically, he sets the tone. This is an amazing thing because eight years later, we're going to be on the moon, folks, right? But when he does this, as he's speaking here, and you can see behind him Lyndon Johnson, right, his vice president, and he says, but why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We don't really know the answers to any of these questions, but it really is kind of, it's there, and we want to do it. Of course, it's also a way that we can defeat the Soviet Union, that we can really show that how a capitalist system is going to be better than a communist one. And we send our own animals up into space. In fact, two of them. Not one dog, but two monkeys, Abel and Baker. You're looking at Baker right here. Abel actually dies about six days after he comes back. Uh, one of his um, uh, sensors that they had uh, surgically implanted went bad and it infected him, and he died. But uh, Baker actually lived until 1981. And so he was a very famous uh, uh, celebrity in Cape Canaveral for that time. I'm, I'm not sure how much he enjoyed that, but he is the first monkey into space. But what we are going to have is in 1959, we begin a program called the Mercury Program. The Mercury Program will actually be our first program to get out into space. And that's its only goal, is just to get out into space. For that, they're going to choose seven men to be on the team. I'd name the seven for you, but I can only name six, and I always leave one off, so I'm not even going to bother to say anything. But wait a minute. Let's see if we can do this now. Wally Schirra, uh, Alan Shepard, Scott Carpenter, John Glenn, Deke Slayton. Where am I now? Okay. Gus Grissom. 
Who am I forgetting? You know? See? You get six, and you can never get the seventh one. And I'll tell you, I'm going to leave here in about five minutes from then. What's it? Gordon Cooper. I knew Gordon Cooper. I was just waiting to see if somebody actually had that. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's good. You know what I hate is you go out, and about five minutes later, you're like, Gordon. And then people on Hartford would be like, this guy was screaming about Gordon Cooper today. There's something weird. You know, now these guys actually, when you look at them, they're pretty much the best of the best. You know, these guys are all college educated. They're all test pilots. They're very good at what they do. And they're going to go up in this, uh, this vehicle. This is the Mercury capsule. It's got room for about one person in here. You could probably fit the Mercury capsule from me to the end of the seats. It wouldn't be much bigger than this. The one seat was also fairly cramped. And actually, we're going to have in 1961, first man who goes up into space will be Alan Shepard. He goes up for 15 minutes. It's funny because he has to wait like three and a half hours for the launch to start. Goes up 15 minutes, and then afterwards he played baseball. So I guess he made it back to Earth okay. Now, Mercury will send men around the Earth, but that's about all it's going to be doing. In 1965, we are going to get a new program, and that program is called Gemini. Now, this program is going to be a midway program between Mercury and Apollo. This program will allow us to do things in space, not just get there, but we're going to see that we've got a new rocket that'll get us up here, and that is going to be the Titan II. Also, we've got a new capsule, and this is a two-man capsule called the Gemini. Now, this capsule is designed to do a couple of things. First of all, it's designed to have hatches that will open up in space so that we can also take our first spacewalk. It is also designed to dock with other space vehicles at the nose. And this is what we're meant to do because we're going to need that technology when we get to the moon. And so we'll find, right, here is just kind of a breakaway of the, of the Gemini capsule. Um, and here in 1966, we're going to have the first spacewalk by a man named Ed White. And so it's only a few weeks after actually Sergei Alexeyev does it. So as you can see, we're kind of just being one-upped and then matching what the Russians do. Oh, excuse me. There we go. Okay. Now, the other thing is here that the um, Gemini program will learn how to dock vehicles in space. Now, folks, next week I'll be talking about the Apollo program. And one of the most nerve-wracking parts of that program was getting the lunar module out of the rocket, bringing it around, and actually being able to dock. And then, later on on the moon, to be able to lift that lunar module and have it redock with the command module. So this is something that's going to be very important for us to be able to, to do successfully. Now, Gemini proves that we can do this, but what we're going to do is, in 1966, we're going to have a new program once Gemini comes through. Chuck Yeager, I always thought, put it really succinctly. In 1966, NASA took over in space, and it has been a bureaucratic mess ever since. The simple fact of the matter is, folks, by the end of the Gemini and beginning of the Apollo missions, it was, that's really true. The government was getting a little bit sloppy in, in the way it did this because it was going for speed, if you understand. We're trying to beat the Soviets. And so, just to kind of close out my talk, because now we're going to be going into the Apollo program, essentially what we will see is that there are going to be about 200 launches before 1967 for the Apollo program. Um, these are not named, so we don't have Apollo 210. We don't have anything like this. But on these launches, Every time they launch, they're going to use another system. They're going to test it out, and then they're going to move forward. Now, what's going to happen is that on January 27, 1967, we're going to be testing out a new rocket, the Saturn I. Now, the Saturn V takes us to the moon, but this is the first of them, an incredibly powerful rocket, literally with hundreds of thousands of pounds of thrust behind it. Now, as the guys are sitting in a capsule, they have been in a capsule for about 13 hours at this point, and they're just doing engineering checks. Does this system work? Does that system work? And the three men, Gus Grissom, one of the Mercury astronauts, Ed White, the man who had taken that first American spacewalk, and then Mark Chafee, very well-regarded pilot, were sitting in this command module of the uh, very early Apollo. And as they were sitting there, you can, you can actually hear this on the Internet. You can get the transcripts for it. Gus Grissom is complaining because they've been in the capsule for 13 hours and nothing is working. The wiring's not working, the communication's not working. And you will hear Gus Grissom say, how are we supposed to go to the moon if we can't talk between three buildings? And then you'll hear a, a slight hesitation, and then, he, and then you'll hear him in his voice, you can hear the anger, he says, Jesus Christ, right? That's it, and then suddenly you hear him say, hey, there's a fire in here, and that's the end of it. 
That's about all you hear. Now, folks, here's what happens. In that capsule, there are three men sitting there, right? You've got a hatch. You've got a hatch that opens inward. That is, if you want to take that hatch off the capsule, it takes 90 seconds to do it in good conditions. And as I said, it opens inward. They also have a pure oxygen environment inside the capsule. So folks, if you ever find that you've drunk a little bit too much, go to an Apollo capsule, sit inside an oxygen-rich environment, you'll probably feel better in about two seconds, all right? However, when a fire begins in a wire bundle in the capsule, what happens is the oxygen-rich environment explodes immediately, and the hatch is going to be immediately blasted outwards because the pressure is not going to allow you to get it off. It's said that the three men probably died within about 15 seconds, but we're not really sure. After there's a fire in here, we don't really hear anything else. We hear somebody cry out, and that's basically the end of it. Thus, what we have actually is AL204, which is what they were doing as their test run, actually will become Apollo 1. And at that point, folks, we are going to begin to really start reforming the uh, space movement because this accident is going to really make people sit up and take notice, and it's going to make them actually do a lot more high-quality work. And remember, it's only going to be two years, and we're going to be in Apollo 11 and getting to the moon. And so, in a sense, General Yeager was right. It had been a bureaucratic mess for a long time. But what we are going to do, folks, is in 1967, we will set our sights on probably the most prime scientific target of the 20th century, and that will be the moon. Now, folks, that's my presentation for today. So I'd like to thank you very much for coming out, uh, especially on a day that's this beautiful. Um, so thank you very much, folks. Uh, if you do have, uh, thanks. Um, if you have any uh, questions or comments, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Just want to give you one thing. If you have a question, um, you might notice you're all movie stars today. Um, and so we have a microphone. If you would like to ask a question, we'd just like to ask you to do it into the mic if you would. Please. How close did the Russians get to the, so did the Soviets get to, to, uh, to the moon? Actually, they ended up in 1969 crashing a craft on the moon. Um, but I, I got to tell you, what happens, um, I don't want to go back to it, but uh, the head of the Russian program met an accidental death in 1966. Nobody's really sure how he died. He died on an operating table. And some people say he died of a heart attack. Some people say cancer. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to sound very base, but um, apparently Soviet documents indicate that he may have been getting operated on for hemorrhoids and died during that as well. I'm, we're really not sure. Um, but once he died, the program really began to sink very, very quickly. And the Soviets, once Apollo went up, the Soviets basically just began to fall behind very much. The next time they were in space in, in good form was going to be Apollo and Soyuz, which was 1975. <laughs> Sorry about the wait. Please. Could you uh, tie the uh, space program a little closer to politics, uh, oh. particularly uh, Kennedy's attitude toward the space program right. uh, and Johnson's uh, program? Some recent uh, writing has suggested that in terms of a larger view of space travel, that Johnson was the real champion, not John Kennedy. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure who would have been the, the big person on it. Um, it, it really depends. I'm not, I'm not so sure about that particular aspect of it. If you're talking about the Apollo program and politics, one of the things you find about it is, as I said before, the idea of competing against the Soviet Union in a friendly fashion, or you know, like sports, was a much more appealing thing than a, a, con, you know, competing in, in nuclear weaponry. Um, the other thing is that if you think about it, uh, you know, if you think about 1968, not the best year America ever had. You know, um, if, you, if you're thinking about things like, for instance, um, uh, Operation Rolling Thunder, right? which is not going to be very successful. Lyndon Johnson saying that he doesn't want to run for president again. Uh, also, the Democratic National Convention. It was a hard year. And so one of the things you find about the Apollo program is that everyone was really relieved to get behind something like that. You're probably aware of this already because of the question you asked. I'm, I'm assuming it. That uh, in December of 1968, Apollo 8 went up. And um, I'm not sure. I will be showing you this next week if you're here. But uh, they, they had that beautiful Earthrise picture. And again, it's a, it's a small thing. It's really just a, this picture you can put on your wall. But at the same time, it really does a lot to kind of pull us together. And I think that probably there were both international and domestic 
considerations that were political in this. The idea that we want to compete, but we don't want to compete with weapons. The idea that also that we're pulling ahead, which is very good for the United States' status. But also, internally, it's nice to have something that we could all get behind and, and be happy about. Um, I'm not sure if you were, uh, if you're, if you, you, uh, you indicated that you knew where you were on July 20th, 1969. A lot of us did. That was really something because for the first time in a long time, we could all look at it and not have to worry about disagreeing. This was a great thing, especially when Walter Cronkite told you it was a great thing. You know, it was pretty good. So I, I think, though, I'm not really sure who would have been the, the real kind of man behind it. Um, Johnson, he, he's interesting because he got a lot done, actually, a great deal done. It may well have been him. Well, thank you very much for coming out today, folks. Hope to see you next week as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you.